Cody's killed a few animals. He's killed, um, he, when he was three, he microwaved a cat. And he's also killed a, a little small dog. My mom had a little Yorkshire Terrier, and he, he said he flipped it and it broke its neck. And then he killed another cat by throwing, throwing uh, logs on it. Cody is just six, but psychotherapist Brina Satterfield fears for his future. If the behavior continues as he heads towards adulthood, he's going to be an extremely dangerous person. Cody isn't just going through a phase. His could be telltale symptoms of violence in later life. He had no remorse for those animals. And she's afraid that he's going to go and, and, and continue with the pattern and start killing people because he doesn't care. She's afraid that he's going to continue you know, become a mass murderer. Ted doesn't work! New scientific research claims we can identify children as young as four or five as potential adult criminals. They have brains that function differently from normal children. There's growing clinical evidence that persistent criminals are different from other law-abiding people. It may be a set of biological factors that tilts them towards a life of crime. And who knows, the science of biology may bring us the hope of some cure for the disease of crime itself. There has been a biological revolution in terms of how we understand crime. And I think one of the implications of biological research is that we will increasingly view criminal behavior as a disorder. The search to understand the roots of criminal behavior has usually focused on the social causes of crime. Poverty and deprivation all play their part. But what the social scientists overlook is the role of the body's biology, especially abnormalities of brain function. This could be the result of accidents or social factors, difficulties at birth, taking drugs, drinking alcohol. Whatever the cause, it results in a brain which many scientists are convinced makes the criminal different from the rest of us. The new discoveries in the exploration of the brain will fundamentally challenge our concept of the very nature of guilt and punishment. In the light of this new science, we can trace the pathway to crime of two adult offenders. Frank is a career criminal. Tony has spent most of his adult life in jail. Are they both just plain bad, or is there evidence that they are the prisoners of their abnormal brains? There has to be something wrong, or else I wouldn't have wasted half my life in prison. Most of us have broken the law as children. Few make a habit of it. Still fewer continue into adult offending. Studies consistently show a tiny handful of children who go on to a career of adult crime. It is true to say that there are a dangerous few. ...who commit most of the misery. They commit most of the crimes. Researchers now believe that we can identify the dangerous few long before they ruin their own and other lives by tests that show how the brain is working. Even more dramatic is the claim that treatment can save children at risk of a criminal career. So who are the dangerous few? Cody was diagnosed at the age of four as suffering from attention deficit and conduct disorder. For 20 years, the Satterfield research team have carried out scrupulously controlled scientific studies of children like Cody. They reveal a consistent abnormality in the electrical activity of the brain. 150 of the children studied are now adults. I'm sorry you miss out this time because I just got Connect 4, but I'm glad that you're playing by the rules. That's terrific. Let's try it again. Attention deficit disorder children who also have conduct disorder were followed by us in a long-term follow-up study 
and half of them had been arrested for felony crimes by the time they reached 18, actually before they were 18. So the combination of attention deficit and conduct disorder is highly predictive of trouble with the law later on in life. Lauren was diagnosed with these disorders when she was four. Her parents were warned that they signaled serious trouble ahead. Lauren, if untreated, if we didn't intervene in her behavior, if we didn't do a hands-on action with her, she would be probably a 12-year-old runaway who was promiscuous in sex and probably, uh, you know, in jail at some point, you know, before she was 20. Lauren is now eight. So what is it that puts children at risk of developing adult criminal behavior? They seem to lack normal feelings and emotions. Lauren's symptoms were typical. Say goodbye. Bye. Let's take a close-up of a kiss. Wait, wait. Lauren was different from birth. Um, she never smiled. That was really, that was really hard. The child never went through that, you know, stage of smiling and cooing and laughing that uh, maybe three or four months old do, and she just never did. Um, and she was so different from what I expected a child to be or compared to her older sister, none of the other children were like this at all. A disturbing symptom is their attitude to suffering. Cruelty to animals inflicted without remorse is one of the clearest indicators of violence in later life. Cody doesn't seem to care that he's done it. When he killed the, the dog, it was my mom's dog we were babysitting, and we get to the airport, and he's yelling out the window, Nanny, I killed your dog, I killed your dog. And he was just real, he thought that was the greatest. He, I don't know, he didn't have any remorse at all. This little boy from a very young age showed a lot of particularly disturbing behavior. He was extremely aggressive to peers early on, and he is to siblings now constantly, to the point where his mother has been told to watch him when he's home all of the time when he's with his siblings. I'm concerned that he might hurt his siblings. Get out of their room, Cody. Cody? Out. Get out. You're not allowed in here. Yes, you are in here. Get out of here, please. You're not supposed to be in here. Do you remember why? Yeah. With his sisters, he'll just hit them for no reason. And uh, if they do anything, the, the slightest thing, he gets really upset. <laughs> they go in his room. He has a tendency to just grab him by the hair, the arm, the leg, and drag him out. <laughs> Come on. They do raspberries where they, with their tongue, and he didn't like that. And so he just backhanded her, just slapped her right across the face. <laughs> Brina said that one day he could blow up and kill one of the one of my daughters out of just anger and not even think twice about it. Baby alert, baby alert. Okay, hold on, Code. Don't touch her. Don't touch her. By school age, Lauren's behavior was leading her into trouble. There was a time that Lauren took a little tile tool to school when she was about four years old. And this tile tool, you could put a piece of tile in it and it could cut the tile. You can also put a finger in it, I suppose it could slice a finger. Um, she was showing kids this tool and I guess uh, it scared uh, the school because I think she had asked a child to go ahead, stick your finger in it. I was called several times by the school because they were concerned about her level of violence and aggression in the classroom. Lauren was forever in trouble. Her mother's attempt to correct her seemed simply to fuel her defiance and her sense of menace. I used to think Lauren was going to kill me. 
in my sleep. Um, because Lauren, she would do whatever her impulses told her. And if I made her mad, I was the one reprimanding her. You know, I was the one who was going to get in trouble for it. And I just used to think that she would kill me. It's a really sad thing for a mother to say. Do you have your lunch by the door? No. Excuse yes. me. I contact. Yes. Lauren, I contact. Yes, I'm all ready. Do you have your lunch by the door? Yeah. OK. This is where uh, I grew up right here. And uh, that's where we stole the car from. This is where I leave that apartment and get into a lot of trouble and sell drugs and we deal our, our marijuana and deal our speed. Danny's ingrained and infant delinquency wasn't diagnosed. His mother hadn't heard of attention deficit disorder. When he started stealing at three, boys, she thought, will be boys. I said, what's under your shirt? And he said, oh, it's a secret. And I said, well, I have to see the secret. And we lifted his shirt, and he had stolen from his little friend about six little cars. And I said, you can't take these. And he said, yes, I can. I had them hidden. Attention deficit disorder children are different than the ordinary child in that the patterns that they get into of lying and stealing are pervasive. They're not transient. They last for longer than six months or a year. Danny came from a well-off and stable family. He had no need to steal. But for him, stealing and the habit of lying became both casual and compulsive. Mischief was maturing into delinquency. He constantly lied. He was the greatest. He, he, and he was very convincing and very good at it. They become quite skilled at um, lying and the predicaments that they had gotten into and the excuses of why they weren't where they were supposed to be or why they had stolen a car or whatever the situation was. He was very gifted at that. Children like Lauren and Cody have a brain abnormality consistently found in those who go on to a criminal career. Good or bad social environment will only have some effect. This basic biological defect is central to the potential for crime. Uh oh, he says. <laughs> the hut? The hut? Don't climb up that way. Don't do it that way. Although they're hyperactive, these children actually suffer from a low level of arousal in a part of the brain called the frontal cortex. Arousal levels can be monitored and measured by the amount of electrical activity in the brain. Scientists have found that one wave pattern, the theta waves, is invariably different in children at risk of criminal behavior. When you're drowsy, the theta waves are slow and large. When you're concentrating, the waves are faster and focused. The at-risk, overactive children have, paradoxically, an abnormal degree of the drowsy pattern. One British study by Adrian Rain measured arousal levels in young boys before any had committed an offence. The critical question, basically, is can those criminals be identified nine years earlier on the basis of the measures of arousal? And the answer is yes, they can. We find that the criminals have an excess of theta activity here. And theta activity is uh, slow wave EEG. It measures um, an under-aroused individual. So essentially, the three measures of arousal were all predicting to who becomes criminal nine years later. What causes low arousal in children? Very often, brain damage results from problems at birth. Cody suffered severe oxygen deprivation when he was born. His deep behavioral disorder is matched by a classic pattern of low arousal. But why should low arousal predispose a child to crime? The answer lies in how the brain works. The frontal cortex regulates the ability to plan and organize behavior. It also controls our emotional reactions. In normal people, important messages from the nerves activate the frontal cortex, which analyzes them and then tells the limbic system how to react. This area generates our emotions like love, anger and fear. The limbic system is the seat of our instinctive, irrational or impulsive behaviour. 
with low arousal, internal communication is more sluggish. So the incoming messages need to be far more sensational than normal to get through to the frontal cortex. This means the cortex is slower to activate the limbic system, which in turn fails to generate normal feelings of fear. Low arousal indexes lack of fear. For example, one thing that stops most of us from committing antisocial acts is that we are frightened about the consequences of committing antisocial acts. Probably because we've been punished for doing antisocial things as children and we remember the consequences of our actions. I know you can. No more flips. If she did something of which she was told not to do, if she broke something, there was no guilt or fear. Um, fear was the biggest thing. She would not be scared of anything. Discipline meant nothing to Danny, because by the age of 10, he was literally fearless. He would stay out all night using and selling drugs and stealing to buy more of them. I started selling the marijuana, and uh, which hooked me on to cocaine, and then hooked me on to uh, crystal meth um, speed. And when I was selling that, that's when I got caught a couple times by uh, other, other police officers uh, in other places, um, hanging out with friends, selling on the streets. We found no matter what the discipline was or the consequences for his misbehavior, it was never enough. We couldn't punish him enough. He was at that point becoming bigger and stronger than I was anyway, and he could walk out the door. I mean, he knew how to ride the bus system. He could steal money. He could take my jewelry, he could sell it, he could do anything he wanted. There was no stopping him. We were really at a loss for answers. <laughs> it may seem contradictory that the overactive child has an underactive brain. But an active frontal cortex is essential to the ability to concentrate. Their low brain arousal means that hyperactive children can't focus their attention. They're always on the move. The primary consequences of not being able to focus attention in school are very, very bright children fall way behind in school. They're unable to do uh, any academic uh, work at the level that they should be able to do it, given their IQs. As they fall further behind, they develop a very low self-esteem and low self-image. They feel that they're wrong or bad very often not behaving to teachers, um, not conducting by the rules, and um, not being able to do good in academics, such as not doing my homework and uh, not doing the schoolwork in class. I just couldn't focus, and I just couldn't concentrate and uh, pay attention to any of my work, which is why I acted up. It's why I, I couldn't focus that made me angry and made me frustrated, and it made me more, act up even more. So this leads into a whole set of negative self-perceptions for the child. And uh, very often they make up for that by doing things, simple, effective, immediate things that make them feel good. But those things very often are not socially acceptable. When I got into trouble, it, um, it made me feel better. I needed to feel like I was a rebel, like I was just just getting into more, more crimes, and, and when I, even when I got arrested, I, sometimes I would feel better about that afterwards because I felt like I did misbehave, and I got, you know, some things I got away with, which I felt good about. At 10 years old, Danny had a reputation as a nasty piece of work. Other children feared and avoided him. But there's another reason why low arousal can lead to extreme behavior. Those with low arousal are driven by the need for excitement. This craving for risk and adventure can either fuel a brilliant career or find fulfillment in crime. Kids with low arousal seek out stimulation to increase their arousal levels back to normal. Now, for some adolescents, joining a gang, burglaring a house, beating somebody up might be their way of getting an arousal jag in life. Yeah, I found it very exciting. That was the whole reason of doing it, all the crimes that I did, um, it was just really exciting to me. I liked the action, um, I liked uh, having to get away from the cops and I thought I was cool, I thought it was a cool thing to do. 
Danny was 15 when he was sent to a juvenile correctional centre for 18 months. We were unaware of what his problem really was other than just being a bad person, a bad kid. We didn't know what to do. Cody and Lauren have been labelled potential criminals. But doesn't childhood deserve the presumption of innocence? Doesn't singling them out itself doom them to delinquency? It does seem uh, a little beyond the pale to take a child, say, in fifth grade and go out and start measuring their arousal and say, well, you're in danger of being a future criminal. That, that, that doesn't seem right to me. If you don't label a child or don't diagnose a child, you can't get him proper treatment. You ready, bud? Yeah. Treatment may indeed be possible. The few studies that have been tried all offer hope that the brain differences that tilt a child to crime can be overcome. Biology need not be destiny. Our brains need not doom us. If we really want to, we can stop a lot of crime by conquering our children's criminal potential. Yeah, yeah, it hurts. He is undergoing intensive treatment. The aim, to change his behavior. The prize, to save him from his potentially criminal self. If you help them just to check off each day, Brina Satterfield's methods are controversial. She has no fears about using science to diagnose children at risk. The first step in a two-year process is to convince the parents that their children are damaged by a brain disorder and need help rather than punishment. Remember that ADD kids do not have a good sense of time. Whether it's a week or a month or five minutes, they don't have a very good conceptual, internalized idea of how long that is. It's hard to, to not look at him and say, he's just misbehaving. He's doing this on purpose. And realize that he has something wrong with him and not, it's, it's really hard to, because he gets to where he drives you nuts <laughs> and it's not his fault. There's something wrong in the brain. Brina, mapped out that there are brain transmitters. And when the transmitter signals don't connect, there's a disorder. Her stealing wasn't her stealing, it was part of this disorder. It made it so much more easier to look at it that way. Five. The next Five. stage is to teach the parents how to cope with these apparent children from hell. One of the immediate problems is that parents are very reactive to what their children's behavior is or fails to be. And so they're constantly chastising their children, very, and there, a lot of anger develops. I truly hated my child. I hated Lauren. I mean, my whole life was turned upside down around this child. I mean, here, the guilt a mother has on feeling hatred towards a child, their own child, Brina made me look at this as a handicap. You wouldn't yell at a retarded child. You wouldn't go smack a retarded child. You know, you just can't. And you have to step back and you have to go, they are incapable of controlling their behavior. They are incapable. You're a star, aren't you, huh? Yeah, I'm a star. The other part of the treatment is chemical. Come here, you need to take your pills. Ritalin is a brain stimulant. You'd think the last thing a hyperactive child needs is stimulation, but it's the underactive brain which needs a kickstart to activate the frontal cortex and help him concentrate. And then I give him his medicine, and about a half hour later he starts to calm down. Cody wouldn't be able to even go to school. He gets so excited and stuff, there's no way he could settle down enough for a teacher to teach him. Without the medicines, he's that out of control with the medication and with everything we've been doing with him he's calm enough where he can go to school he gets good grades and they haven't really noticed too much of a problem but the studies show that drugs alone are no magic bullet for delinquency Brina reckons a child like Cody will need two to three years of help before he begins to feel and act like other children. I want to kick out. Good. Really? No, but then, because I don't want to. 
Oh, the basketballs. Oh, I'm going to do the The drugs help Cody concentrate on the learning. It'll take a long time to translate this into being a more considerate and tender child. I think you like to throw things, right, when you get mad? Mm. Only sometimes I do that when I get mad. Mm. Did you get mad at that cat when you were throwing wood at the cat? Were you mm. mad at the cat for something? He didn't do nothing to me. Well, why did you throw the wood at the cat and kill the cat? I don't know why. You don't know why? Mm -mm. I wonder if you were mad about something at that time. Were you mad at somebody else or about something else? I wasn't mad at, I wasn't mad at somebody. I don't know why I hit the cat. A child such as this doesn't have the same set of feelings that you or I would have when we hurt another person. He doesn't have the sense of shock or horror at what that means. And then what happened? And on the way home, I threw rocks at him. You threw rocks at him? Yeah. And after that, my, my dad called me. OK. But did you ever think of saying, Kevin, that's making me really angry, and I don't want to be your friend if you're going to treat me that way? Hey, give me one of these, please. Come on. Hopefully, treatment will help him to understand how others feel when he hurts them. Good behavior in the living room. Half out of 50. Okay, well, here, take your chips. Okay. How many do you get for eating all your breakfast? Three. Three? A further layer to Cody's intensive treatment is less sophisticated bribery. The parents are asked to operate a reward system. Look at how many chips you get. Come here. Okay, what did you get for study time? Uh, everything. Do you think you did good? Three. Three? Yeah. You know what? What? I think you did so good. Yeah. I think you did super good. Five. Wow. That is the best study time you've ever had. Yeah. Yeah. Little plastic chips are given to the child for specific good behavior. The child can then cash in these chips for the pleasure of watching television, going to play with a friend or whatever. It's a juvenile capitalism whereby the child sells not his labor, but his behavior, and the whole family profits. You'd be surprised what a little piece of plastic <laughs> does. He really is motivated to earn those, otherwise he doesn't get to do anything. And so he, he works really hard trying to get them. It's uh, bribery, but it works. At the moment. Lauren's family have completed three the years of the Satterfield Good. treatment. She still needs Good. stimulants to help her concentrate, but the mix of therapies Great. have Great. changed Great. her behavior. And Francine is no longer afraid of her daughter. Thank God I don't have that fear anymore. Um, Lauren's not that child anymore. She has guilt now. She has a little fear. She has a conscience. She feels sensitive towards other people's pain. She's the first one over to a child who's hurt themselves in school. This is not the child that was five years ago who couldn't care less about anybody or anything. Yes, everybody. Brain abnormalities such as Lauren's can strike in the ghettos as they can in middle-class suburbia. The difference is a privileged family can afford to invest the money and the time in treatment. Other children who completed the Satterfield course are now law-abiding adults. In our multimodality intervention study, we found that we could reduce the uh, criminal arrest rate by about 50 percent. And uh, this uh, is a cost-effective treatment. A year's treatment costs 2,000 pounds. A year in a juvenile detention center like this one costs 17,000. A life of crime for one repeat offender can cost the taxpayer more than a million pounds. But there's no complete guarantee of success. The ethical dilemma is this. As a parent, what do you do? Do you risk putting your child into these intervention programs and risk labeling your child as a future violent offender, even though your child has committed no violent crimes 
right now. That's one side of the scenario. The other side is if you ignore that possibility and don't put your child into intervention programs, there's an 80% chance that he will become a violent criminal offender. And he'll not only destroy his own life, he'll destroy your life, the lives of uh, his brothers and sisters, and more importantly, the lives of innocent victims of his violent crimes. Danny is too old for the Satterfield treatment. But is it too late to correct the biology that makes him a wrecker? After release from detention, Danny's parents, in desperation, tried a new, untested method to correct abnormal brain patterns. It's called biofeedback. My behavior was so bad in the past that we didn't think that we could change it, and we didn't think there was anything that can change it. And um, when I started, I mean, we just tried it out basically um, just to see if it would help at all. The first stage was clinically to assess whether or not Danny had the classic abnormal brain pattern. The evaluation of EEG showed us a predominant theta activity uh, that meant low arousal. And low arousal is bound to conduct disorder. He had incredible conduct disorder, <laughs> such as um, using drugs and selling drugs, stealing cars, um, threatening the family members, sometimes even becoming violent in the family. The scientific evidence is that under the right conditions, we can retrain our own brains to change our own arousal levels. And I'd like you now to look in front of you and focus on Pac-Man. Be as re relaxed as you can be. That's very good. Just be very, very Biofeedback relaxed. sounds like fringe science. It involves, in this case, a simple video game. The difference is that it's the patient's own brain waves, not his hands, that control how well the game is played. If you focus more, the Pac-Man will be eating more of the pellets. Um, when you get unfocused, you can see that he slows down and he stops eating the pellets less. So it's, it is a really good game because it really keeps your attention focused. And as you're concentrating on them, that is making your brain concentrate. The more sessions you have done, the faster the results will be. So if you do three times a week, in about a year, you have a complete and permanent change in your brain activity. Danny's brain waves have changed, and so has his fearless, selfish quest for sensation. Now, his brain waves are in a normal range. So it's a normalization of his uh, electrical brain activity that leads to, of course, a normal behavior. And within three weeks, a, a total miracle had happened. He went from making, first of all, from being interested, not interested in school, to becoming interested, and from making Fs to get, bringing home As perfect scores on tests and reports. About feedback is a miracle to me. Um, it's, it's just the most amazing thing. Um, for me, as long as I stay focused and I stay off drugs and I'm staying uh, clean and sober, then uh, those 30 sessions are going to stay with me for a long time. And so far, it's worked. Uh, my concentration is, is already up. It's almost like taking a pill that cures you for the rest of your life. It's too early to claim a miracle fix for 20-year-old Danny's delinquency. But he recently attended his sister's wedding, the first family event he'd been to in years, played a song he'd written, and passed his exams with distinction. When I go to the music school in the future and, uh, and try to get a good degree and lead somewhere to a good career in the future, There's been no systematic assessment of biofeedback. Even so, the Texas Correctional Center, hardly soft on crime or woolly on the causes of it, is giving the system a trial. And provisional results are encouraging for delinquent young men like Danny. But treatment is the exception. No one in Britain, for instance, is trying the Satterfield approach. Not many children are able to get appropriate treatment. Many children go on without treatment to failure in school, 
failure with peers and in society, and usually they become the outcasts, and some of them become predatory and attack other people physically. Others just drop out from society, and they drop out from school, and they don't have very useful lives. And it's among those, the persistent criminals whose lives have been wasted in jail, that we'll find more evidence of the link between brain abnormality and crime. Could earlier treatment have helped them escape the prison of their criminal minds? Britain's prisons house more than 50,000 inmates. How many of them are incapable of controlling their actions? For some, can the very notion of guilt apply? Hundreds of studies have measured the brain arousal levels of persistent offenders. And the clinical tests, including those from British prisons, all tell the same story. For at least the last 50 years, we've been finding that uh, criminals uh, or antisocial individuals tend to evidence low arousal, low physiological arousal. Low arousal, as we've seen, means the intelligent frontal areas of the cortex are not instructing the limbic system of the brain to generate the appropriate responses a normal person feels. A person with high arousal is liable to panic and fall to pieces, uh, while an individual with very low arousal will simply deal with the situation rationally. Uh, and so th this maybe gives you a clinical idea of why low arousal may be useful for um, a criminal and why it may predispose an individual to become a criminal. It's very good. Just be very, very relaxed. The recidivist criminal, or persistent offender, suffers from the same brain abnormality that we saw in Danny. Tony is a classic repeat offender. He spent most of his adult life in prison. As with Danny, his upbringing doesn't explain why he took to crime. My family upbringing was very good, actually. I came from a very loving and caring home. I have no excuses. Tony was born into a morally upright, lower middle class family. Just like Danny's parents, Tony's father can't see what went wrong. The upbringing we gave him, we didn't teach him to steal or he didn't have to steal. He got what he wanted, more or less, from us that we could give him. I don't really know why he went off the rails, no idea. Is there a biological answer to the puzzle of Tony's offending? How much of Danny's pattern does he fit? As a child, Tony's pattern of behaviour was similar to Danny's. He had all the symptoms of attention deficit disorder and hyperactivity. When you look back now, it might, have been, it might have been hyperactive. I was always an active child. Um, I was always doing something. I had to be active. I could get distracted very, very easily, especially from the boring things in life. So I can't sit still. I don't think I ever remember him reading a book. That wouldn't be enough for him to keep him occupied. But just sit quietly, I think, was unheard of. Other, more exciting temptations beckoned. A younger person showed me how to steal cars. If I couldn't afford it, oh, I'll steal it. And that was uh, a kind of a breakdown of the law and order situation, which started at about 11 and got out of control by about 17, I suppose. And it, it broke my heart, really, when, when I first found out he was in prison. I thought, his mother, it nearly killed her. Well, it certainly did. This is Frank, a career villain. He served 15 years for robbing a silver bullion van. His pathway to crime is perhaps more understandable. Unlike Philip, he grew up in disadvantage. Crime, to some in the East End of those days, was a way of life. Frank started to steal in a small way when he was only a child. I used to feed out of uh, Stratford Market. So feed of boxes of cabbages and cauliflowers, carrots, onions, thingy, but not to uh, sell. So just take them in the street and give them, let the people in the street have them. Rita Strange lived next door to Frank. She feels the real trouble started when he got a job managing the local billiard hall. The hall had something of a reputation. We knew there was all crooks went in there. Everybody knew there was all crooks in there. I suppose you heard about money you could get. 
I suppose that's what really started him. He thought, oh, I'll have a bit of money. Frank and George were best friends. We weren't rich. We were always good no street kids. But if you see someone else making it, however they've made it, whether it's through villainy or whether it's through honest means, sometimes you think, cool, I want a bit of that cake. And I think that's how Frankie was. But George resisted stealing the cake and joined the Navy. As for Frank, he enjoyed the frenzy and action of boxing. But so do a lot of East End children, and they don't grow up to be criminal. Did Frank box because of an underactive brain which couldn't concentrate at school and craved sensation? When I'd done the bullion robbery, it was the thrill of it. I would say more so than the, the money. So they tell us more about nouns. We make writing more interesting. Frank is only now learning his ABC. He found reading and writing impossible as a lad. Over a hundred studies show that career criminals have a low verbal IQ. Was Frank's disadvantage another bias of the brain to crime? You've far better idea of what the sentence is about. Yeah. yeah? There's another clue deep in the furrows of the brain. When scientists compared the brains of non-criminals with persistent offenders, they found that the language side of the criminals wasn't working as well. We found the left hemisphere to be much poorer in terms of processing verbal material. And it just may be that processing verbal material is very important in terms of learning social rules. A conversation between the two hemispheres of the brain is essential if the left side is to control the impulsive and emotional right side of the brain. An internal moral code is critically important in the development of a conscience. And effectively, if you don't have that internal regulation of verbal processes, then one may be less able to generate that internal verbal code which guides and regulates your social behaviour. But there's still more to the new discoveries of the link between crime and the brain. There may be a fault in the very structure of the brain of the persistent offender. 2,000 such criminals were submitted to a battery of neurological tests. The recidivists we've studied over the years, uh, the probability is probably over 90% that he has an abnormality uh, of his brain. From the neurological tests, the brain's functions could be mapped. The grey area indicates low activity. The normal brain is on the left, and this is the brain of the career criminal. The frontal cortex in the repeat offender isn't working properly. The rational area of the brain isn't controlling the instinctive and impulsive limbic area. We have urges, uh, a gas pedal go system, and we have a braking system to put the brakes on, the inhibition. And what most of these recidivists appear to lack is the braking system. So when that part of the brain is dysfunctional or damaged in some cases, uh, those brakes are gone. And uh, the individual is a victim of their urges and will continue to commit crimes, often silly crimes, and of no real substance in terms of gain for them. Tony's crimes fit the pattern of criminal brake failure. His wife knows that failing well. He just does so many things on impulse. That he, he never stops to think about a thing. If it's what he wants to do, he does it. End of. And he won't stop to think of the consequences. Oh! oh never mind. Never mind. We gotcha. Tony and his wife, married for 20 years, have spent just three of them together. She stood by him and pays him regular visits along with the grandchildren. She's never understood why, with so much to lose, Tony took to crime. In fact, I'd say that I was a bit vulnerable, really, because the times he's promised not to do it and still gone and done it, you know. Even at the fault of losing the marriage, losing the children, we wasn't in a bad financial way. We've got a nice home. He really didn't need to do it. But he did it. So. That's it, sir. Tony and Frank fit the criminal brain pattern revealed by new research. The rough and tumble of growing up, the inevitable accidents of youth, can compromise the brain. 
another weight on the scales of disadvantage to add to the social or economic ones tilting the balance to crime. You need a combination of factors uh, to become a criminal. Uh, it's a little like a poker game. It doesn't help to have a 10, jack, queen, king. You also need the ace. And uh, every one of those is equally important because if you don't have one, you're not going to have the flush and you won't have the criminal behavior as an analogy. Get it out of ya! So Come are they both on. the victims of their brains, the prisoners of their biology? Are they guilty? Come on, that's one it. could argue that uh, they are victims of, of their brain dysfunction and uh, don't have the same control that a normal person does. But if you say that the psychologists are saying that if it's a brain disorder, you're not guilty, I'd love to go along on that one. But that's the easy way out. I mean, I know what is right and what is wrong. The fact that I act before I think, is that an excuse? I'd love to think it was, but I don't think it'll be accepted. If we were to diagnose some career criminals as suffering from a disorder, doesn't this give a carte blanche towards excusing such behaviour? No, absolutely not. Even though they may be suffering from a disorder, we still need to institutionalise them. We need to protect society. Treatment in prison is virtually unknown. But what if Frank had been offered the help that Cody, Lauren and Danny had? Could he have avoided a lifetime of failure and disappointment? I think if I'd have been good at anything, if I could train properly, I think that would have been my life. If I'd have been able to box, I don't think I'd have took to crime. I think it's because I was a failure that they might took the crime. I was a failure at crime and all. And what about Tony? Would we recognise the danger signs in another young Tony today? When I look back now, my inability to sit still or concentration could be or may be one of the reasons I'm sat here now. If we could have spotted that, perhaps. But we're looking now and I'm 50 years of age. It's a bit late. We just want to see where the future goes from here. Okay. One prays and honestly and genuinely believes that this is it. But I said that last time and totally convinced myself last time that the last time was enough. You've got a funny face all the, the time. The temptations of freedom are a long way off. Tony has still got four years of his sentence to serve. Thank you. Or translated. <laughs> oh, that's what I think. It's so sad. He's such a nice... I know he's my brother and perhaps I'm a bit biased, but then... He's such a nice guy to have wasted his life like this. It really is so sad. I'm not used to babies. Could what we know today have salvaged that wasted life and spared us all the misery and expense of Tony's criminality? Recognising the biological roots of crime seems to have worked for our American children, breaking the chains that bound them to a seemingly inevitable delinquent career. Okay. Lauren is growing up to be a normal little girl in a family that had the courage to recognise that she was ill and needed help. And what Brina taught me is that I could hate this disorder and love the child. And I, I fell in love with Lauren. I mean, she really was a beautiful child with an ugly disease. R -E -D. Cody, too, is showing signs that the treatment is beginning to work. Cody is very intelligent for his age, and since we've been working with him, I know that he's not going to go to prison. He's going to go to college, become a doctor, a lawyer. Not one thousandth of the cost of criminal justice has been spent on trying new methods like raising arousal levels with adult criminals. But at least we now know that biology need not set our destinies, unless we let it. We didn't really understand it, but we just saw the results of it, which were astonishing, amazing. I'm, I, don't, I don't know if he would have lived without it. That's how strongly I feel about it. And I was so skepti skeptical in the beginning that, thank God, I took a chance and he did it. I would have never known.
Danny can now look forward to the rest of his life. Our second programme will explore whether or not the same clinical understanding of the brain that saved him could apply to the violent offender. Thank you.